Former Councilman Don McLean, who has not arrived yet, but I think we're going to get started now since it's after 7. So, welcome to the Beaches Branch. Uh, my name is Teresa Rooney. I'm the branch manager. Um, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of consolidation, which will occur on October 1st, I have partnered with my favorite partner, Beaches Watch, to um, bring you a very, very special program tonight, which is very near and dear to my heart. Um, consolidation and, and heart is not, not always something that you put together, but it's something that I have a lot of um, respect for. So, what I would like to do is introduce our panelists. First, we have Bill Bassford, who was on the City Council in 1967. Former City Council Auditor Bob Johnson, who was just a young man, probably <laughs> right out of college, right? Who was the, who was well, the Council Auditor you. that you worked for? <laughs> then we have Matt Carlucci, Yep. Uh, a lot of you will remember Matt from his time on the council, not once, but three times. Uh, how many? Three, three terms? And you may be wondering why Matt is here. Matt is here because his father was Joseph Carlucci, who was a dynamo on the council. Yes, he was. Um, Bill Gulliford is here. Bill, you were around at Consolidation, right? Actually, uh, my oldest son was built, born on October 1st, 1968. Well done. How about that? Well done. So I'll go take him a present this Monday. Maybe I'll give him the book, The Quiet Revolution. <laughs> but I, I wanted to, I did not want to do this program without him because um, he has the most experience in dealing with the interlocal agreement, which some of you may recall from the 1990s. I think that may even be how Beaches Watch got formed. Does, am I correct about that? But Bill has a lot of experience in making sure consolidation is working correctly. Uh, then we have Walter Williams, former city councilman, and Walter Dickinson, who was the Beaches Councilman for the Beaches District, which was then District 1, if you can believe that. And last but certainly not least, <laughs> we have um, one of my favorite people, our moderator, Professor Tim Gilmore. Um, I have so many people I want to recognize. I'm going to just try to do it really quickly. We have uh, in the back our, the president of our friends group, Josh Messenger. We have our library director, Tim Rogers. Tim. Uh, I heard Harry Shorstein was coming, but I don't see him. He didn't make it. Um, and nor did Jim Reineman, uh, but we do have Mr. Richard Bowers, who some of you will remember has served under many mayors in many capacities. Uh, Richard Wallace, also former city council auditor. Um, mayor Elaine Brown, former mayor Dick Brown. Yay. And Jim Overton, last, oh no, no. 
Jim Overton, former city council member, sitting next to his buddy, John Crescenbetty, who is on the council right now. And Chris Hoffman, I see you're all sitting there. One, two, three. Okay, am I leaving anybody out? Rory, oh, okay, I'm sorry, Rory, I did not recognize you. Welcome, thank you for coming. Let's see if I missed anybody else. Okay, well with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I wanna uh, try to be brief. <laughs> uh, we uh, are here for, for two hours tonight and really we could have this discussion for uh, a whole college semester, so. Uh, I want to uh, real quickly thank Teresa Rooney and the Public Library and uh, all of our uh, public servants who are here with us who have given so much to the city and this community for so many years. Uh, and real quickly, I want to say the best discussions, I think, don't end when they end, um, which means that I think the, this discussion that we have tonight or, and the discussions that we start tonight will continue into the, com into the community uh, after this evening. So I, I have a series of questions, uh, some of which are my own, uh, a number of which came from different people from the community who contacted me over the last couple of weeks. And uh, I, if possible, I'd like to get uh, your thoughts both fully and succinctly, so there's a balance uh, because of time. Uh, so uh, here's my first question, and whoever wants to take it uh, can take it. Hopefully, uh, we'll get something from, from each of you, but uh, can, could you share with us a memory of the time leading up to consolidation or amidst its taking effect that the public at large might not know. Uh, your memories, related as they are to this specific historic event, are invaluable. So uh, I'm really intrigued by what might come out. Who wants to uh, start with that? Uh, Matt Carlucci. My dad, uh, Joe Carlucci, was on the first consolidated City Council Jacksonville, and he had a very fertile imagination. And to prove the point that the St. John's River was highly polluted and there were outfalls, he and some buddies went and poured lots of red dye at the old city hall at 220 East Bay Street in the toilets. Only the men's toilets, but the toilets. And they poured them in there, and they flushed, they poured them in there, and they flushed, they poured them in there, and they flushed, and they walked out to the end of the parking lot. About 20 minutes later, it here comes, comes the red dime. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so that was a, a kind of a way of proving the point that St. John's was. And then the other thing that um, our family did, uh, is a, that's a great memory to me, uh, in, in, in etched in my soul forever, was the signs that we made. My brother was nine, was seven years older than I was. He was a, a very good artist. He knew how to do silk screening. So my father decided to take advantage of that talent he had. And, well, there was like 11 public officials indicted and on 142 counts of stealing money, bribery, larceny, it was awful. I told some folks earlier here, it was, a, it was an accumulation of crises that, that made consolidation actually pass. So uh, my father decided to, uh, he, he wanted to put a sign together, so my brother designed one that said, run, run the rascals out of City Hall. And we printed about 700 of those signs in our backyard. My job was to take it from underneath the silk screen, run it to the corner of the yard, put it down so it would dry, and then come back and get the next one. Over and over and over. And then about, uh, this was all about maybe two or three weeks before the election for consolidation. We placed those signs in the most strategic spots all over the place where we knew that they would count the most. And I can remember as a 12 year old, me and my dad being out till 12, one, two o'clock, uh, hanging signs that said, run the rascals out of City Hall, and it caused quite a stir uh, in the news uh, the next couple of days. Also, we made some signs that said, happiness is yes, so that meant the vote yes for consolidation. 
And we, we, we actually did about 2,000 of those and hung them everywhere in pamphlets. And so it was, it was quite a day. And that's my, that's my great memory of the time with my family. One of, uh, excuse me. One of the first memories I have is when the city council started. Uh, they actually took office in 1967. They were elected in 67, but then they began office in their offices in 1968. The first two employees that were hired were the council auditor and the council secretary. The council auditor was Gene McLeod, my boss, and the council secretary was Dave McNamara. And I remember we were on the uh, 13th floor, I believe, in City Hall, and we were the only two employees. Was that one was? 13th floor. And we were, uh, and then Gene hired me, and I came in in July 1, 1968, three months before consolidation. But uh, Bill was on the, had been on the city council, and he'd been, I mean, on the county commission. He was chairman of the county commissioners. And he, he was also elected to serve on the first city council. But what I remember most vividly is there are lots of folks did not want consolidation, especially people who were in the county and who were the city. First of all, they're employees. You know, you're a county employee. You didn't know what your position would be. And if you were a city, you didn't know what your position would be. And most of the people uh, and elected officials, they were opposed to it. As a matter of fact, and Bill might remember this, the, uh, I hate to say it, but one of the officials that was in charge of the county records threw them away. Well, he didn't throw them away, but he dumped them in an attic. And there was one fellow that's not here tonight, but he deserves a lot of credit, and Walter Williams remembers him very well, his name Royce Lyles. Royce was just a flunky in the city department, accounting department. <laughs> Nobody was trying to put a budget together. So Royce volunteered, and he says, I'm going to, I'll go out there and try to put the budget together, because nobody did. And for him, and two or three of his employees, George Dandelake was one, and he hired out of the fresh graduate from JU, and they started putting this budget together, and to this day, I want to tell you, that was a miraculous job. I don't know how they did it. But they, they finally did, because they, we had to go and dig records out of the, out of the attic to put the county, the county records in there, because they'd all throw them all away. My favorite clerk of circuit court. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but that the first budget, I remember, it was really, really something to put it together. And the night that that thing passed, I was just the most amazed guy in the whole place because I just didn't think that we would be able to get all that information in because very few people were working on it. But that was my memory. First night of consolidation. Wow. Oh, I, I'm t I was too young to remember too all that. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Actually, I was way, I had finished school and I was way in the service when all this was going on. So. And then I got back in time for my son to be born, as I mentioned. But I got some memories since then. <laughs> and, and we'll definitely get to those. Uh, Me too. <laughs> about uh, Council Member uh, Williams or Dickens? I'm sorry, I have bad hearing. Oh, sorry. I should use my microphone more. Uh, so uh, any particular memories of the time period around consolidation that uh, perhaps is not something that everybody in the public knows. One of the things I remember the most is the, t the time that the council put in in that first council. Most of the council were putting in 40 and 60 hour weeks on a part-time job mm -hmm. to put the two governments together. And if you want to talk about fun, it was a the justices of the peace back then were all powerful and then we had to, as a council, calm that down and uh, get those offices under the consolidated government and, get, and eventually to eliminate them. Uh, they allowed them to run for judge and if I remember right, it was two or three of them got elected to the judge and then they eventually got this, uh, sir, not the circuit, the county court. And uh, 
they, they they served in the county court and then were not allowed to run for re-election, at best I remember. That they did away with the the uh, JPs being uh, judges. Uh, the other thing that I guess I remember the most is these were not politicians that were in there. They they were business people like Walter Dickinson here and uh, Wallace Covington I had an electric company. I, if, I, if I remember right, Wallace only served one term. Uh, there, and, a, and I am Salzbacher was just an outstanding uh, counselor. And in fact, I always remember I am because if I was working on something and I didn't couldn't find it, and I couldn't find the I am, he had a filing system. You could go to his filing system and find anything. Mm -hmm. And he, the other thing I, I will remember the most is we were working on that first budget and Bob Johnson and, uh, Gene McLeod? Yeah. yeah. And they, w we went to get that final budget and we couldn't get an agreement. And myself and I am and one or two more, I don't remember what, I don't know if you were in there, I think you were in there too, Bob. We were in the office and, and Bernie Palco said, well, we can't get it done, we leave it. Yes. And Earl Huntley got up and stood in front of the door and said, we're not leaving until we get this budget agreed to. And he was a rough and tough ex-Marine. <laughs> you remember that, Bob? Oh, yeah. And he said, we're not, and they got the budget. And then the reporter from Channel 4 wanted to know what went on in there. We said, we'll let you know later. He said, well, what about Government of Sunshine? We said, what about it? We had this budget done. <laughs> and, and, uh, so, uh, uh, I'll tell you, let me tell yep. you another story. Why he, okay. Walter was a part of this. He, he's right. The, the, our budget sessions would start in the afternoon, and they would go until the wee hours of the morning. And I am Salzbacher was the uh, chairman of the finance committee, and Walter was on it. And one morning, about three o'clock, we got through with the regular agenda, and I am pulls out this file that Walter's talking about, and he says, "Now I want to share with you the correspondence that I've received this week." John Lanahan was on the council. He jumps up and he says, "I am has your wife locked you out of the house?" <laughs> says, "You don't want to go home, do you?" And anyway, the finance committee got up and left at 3 o'clock in the morning. And so only Gene McLeod and I were left, and I am turned around, and he looked at us, and he says, boys, I think I've lost my committee. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that three, was one of those late <coughs> mornings, yeah. 3, three o'clock in the morning is either yeah. late or early. I'm not sure which. Um, we are um, at the beach, so uh, we need to acknowledge that, I think. Uh, because, uh, after all, we are holding this conversation in uh, uh, a community that chose a different path. So, uh, I want to ask uh, whoever would like to speak to this, uh, how important it was for Baldwin and for the beaches uh, to retain uh, their measure of autonomy, uh, and how you think uh, agreeing to that autonomy affected the vote uh, the implementation of consolidation and the relationship between Jacksonville and the beaches in Baldwin since that time. Could we go till 10 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll, I think, I think maybe I'm not the three, someone said. I think I may be the appropriate one to take that one. For those in the audience that are not aware of the structure of the original vote, the concern on the part of those who were in favor of consolidation and promoted it was that the beaches being independent minded would not vote for consolidation because they were independent and thought that, that would be impacted by the loss of their municipal identity. 
So there was a second question on the ballot at the beaches in Baldwin. Namely was, if you, in, in essence, it allowed them to vote for consolidation and to retain their municipal entities. Which seemed like a good idea at the time to encourage the vote, but it created a great number of problems. Because after that, nobody knew what the structure should be. And that led to a court action which prompted a 1982 interlocal agreement. And even that interlocal agreement was not particularly good because it wasn't well defined or specific. In other words, it would say things like animal control. What does that mean? What it ultimately meant was the beaches communities, when I was the mayor of Atlantic Beach, ended up getting their own animal control because we could never get Jacksonville to provide it. Then in 1992, the city of Atlantic Beach filed a double taxation suit against the city of Jacksonville over this issue. And at the same time, some of you may remember a movement at the beach called Ocean County. I pulled out one of my old Ocean County t-shirts and wore it a couple of nights ago. <laughs> should have worn it tonight. Yes, it was pretty good. I should have worn it. Well, it was dirty. I couldn't wear it tonight. Uh, hadn't been washed yet. Um, I elect, chose not to run for re-election as a mayor, and I kind of was needling that movement, both movements. And, um, and we ended up, the beach cities ended up settling when John Delaney became mayor in 1993 and 4. They reached a settlement agreement, and there was an amendment to the interlocal agreement for each city which I still to this day can't exactly understand why the people in Neptune Beach and Atlantic Beach pay for tipping fees and the people in Jacksonville Beach do not. Uh, interesting conjecture. The basics of our suit was this. The fundamentals of it was, and I'm glad we've got these experts and these folks that have long memories because there's been something that's been troubling me for a number of years and that is, how did they arrive at the 18.8% differential that, was the, that created the millage rate that was charged to the beach. In other words, folks, those of you who are the beach taxpayers, you pay 18.8% less than those in Jacksonville. And that differentiation is to recognize that they are providing county service. I asked Florida Tax Watch to give me a breakdown of seven counties, all, most of them are large metropolitan counties in Florida, and what they charge in their incorporated areas or their incorporated parts of their county for county services. In other words, what's the millage rate that they charge? And I took that today and came up with an average. That average was 5.05 .05 mills. Right now, currently, or currently last year in Jacksonville, we, um, we had a, we, we at the beach were assessed over eight mills. My contention always was that we were overcharged at least by two mills. But again, I go back to the question, the fundamental question. I don't know how 18.8% was arrived, and maybe Mr. Johnson can tell me how that happened, or what the, but, but I don't, we still, and that was prompt, sort of prompted the lawsuit, part of what prompted the lawsuit was that we felt like for the services that we rendered, were rendered, we were paying too much. And I think you also recognize, because of the high appreciation of property values out here, that probably the per capita contribution is, is higher at the beach than anywhere else. Now, I'm not whining. Consolidation's got a lot of good attributes to it, and, 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 I, and I'm a proponent to a degree, except for the people that I represent sometimes in arguing that they're not completely treated fairly. Um, I, I think it was, a, at the time, I think it was the right thing to do, especially with what the problems that Jacksonville had going. It, it, was, it was severe. But, you know, it started out convoluted. It's gotten a little bit better. Our relationship with Jacksonville is obviously better than it has been. People like John Crest and Benny have been very supportive. And, uh, uh, but sometimes you feel like it's gonna be an 18 to one vote down there and Elaine and Dick can, address, can certainly speak to that. But that's a little bit of history for you. And okay. I'd love to hear some other comments about how we got at the 18.8%. <clears throat> well, the 18.8 uh, started when uh, at the time, the 18.8, Jacksonville, the city of Jacksonville Beach was the one that led the charge on that one. And the, the uh, county millage was 12 point something and the beaches was 10 point something. And the only reason the beaches was at 10 point something was because there was some geo debt service on the thing. So they got the differential between the two, which was 18.8 at that time, and that's what it was settled on initially. Another one you can talk about is that <laughs> 
how that, that new one was arrived at. The differential now. It went from 18, it, I, I, think you, I think you determined it, that it was equal to 1.7907 and now the differential is 3.2907 mils between, between one and the two. Now that was, that was done, even Mayor Delaney said that was done on a table in Atlantic Beach between the Atlantic Beach mayor and John Delaney. And that's the way that that formula was, came about. And that sounds like a, a fascinating um, short story and footnote to a short story. <laughs> um, so decimal points in Mildred Rates. And I, I have a question about Mildred Rates in a bit too. Uh, but I want to try to, for the sake of time, keep things general too. Uh, Mr. Carlucci, you had uh, you, well, something you wanted to say. It, what, what I wanted to say is, uh, by the way, Bill, I, I have some great reading material on all the uh, on the interlocal derailments, and it's pretty complicated. Uh, but the beaches were doing fine. The problem was Jacksonville. The problem was the inner city of Jacksonville, Florida, was going broke. Uh, in 1950, the city population, the inner city population, the old city limits, was 204,000 with a budget of $23 million. Fifteen years later, the budget went from 23 to $94 million, and the population had actually dropped. So that's what the problem was. The, the old city limits was going bankrupt. Duplication of city services. So again, I'm kind of back on the other side of the, of the intercoastal at this point. We had a county planning department, a city planning department, a county recreation department, a city recreation department, the county road patrol, the city the police department, and it just went on and on and on, and there was no requirement for these two different governments, county and city, to work together, to plan together, no requirements. And guess what? They didn't. But what they did do was steal a lot of money. What they did do was waste a lot of money, and then you have on top of that, and the council doesn't really have much to do with schools, but it compounded the crisis at the time. We had 11, I mean, we had all of our high schools were discredited, like that. And then when you look at the river, and I alluded to that earlier, there were 600 million gallons of untreated raw sewage flowing in the St. Johns River the U.S. News and World Report called it a flowing cesspool. And so when you had all of these crises happening at one time, Jacksonville had to come to grips and do something about it. And civic leaders came together, and the elected officials did. And, you know, it's like uh, Councilman Gulliford said, most of the people were for, were for consolidation, some were not. Um, through the anniversary we have here, no, no voices have been silenced because the conversation still goes on. Uh, you can argue the goods and the bads of consolidation, but I'll tell you this, I don't think 50 years ago we could have ever imagined where we would be today. But I say all of that to say this, uh, part of the, the reason that the beaches needs us, and we need the beaches. But they weren't in trouble. The city was, so we had to find a way to live together, and that involved the city providing some county services to the beaches area, and so therefore, there had to be interlocal agreements made. And I was in on the local agreement with Atlantic Beach when uh, you were mayor of Atlantic Beach, and, and it was quite a show. But but I remember I remember Warren Jones and Chuck Arnold coming down to meet with us, and that was a, quite a show too. <laughs> well, Councilman Goldberg, uh, I have I have learned is is beloved in this beach is because I think he's fought so hard for the beaches and for Atlantic Beach, and so it's very hard to explain the in local agreements, and so I'm going to kind of gloss over them. Uh, because we could be here till 10 tomorrow right, talking right. about them. <laughs> but, the, but the bottom line is, Jacksonville was, was having the problems, not Baldwin and not the beaches. The mm. beaches have always enjoyed their independence, but you know, sometimes they need us. 
but I highly so does Jacksonville need the beaches. So we try to form these interlocal agreements and work out a, a compromise as best as possible. They're not easy, but they get done eventually. And, and so you kind of got your beach city, so y'all get to vote that live out, y'all that live out here at the beach, you get to vote for two mayors, we get to mm -hmm. vote for one back in Jacksonville. <laughs> right. Which would be a fascinating question in and of itself to talk about. Yeah. Um, consolidation is so complicated and there's so many facets of it. Uh, I, I want to move to uh, several of them if we can. Uh, and I also want to encourage some of our other uh, panel members uh, that maybe uh, I haven't given enough time to. Uh, but I want to move actually based, Mr. Carlucci, on what you just said to uh, first discussing uh, the county itself and suburban communities that were at the time new and at the time outside of the city limits. And then I'd like to move to talking about uh, the, the so-called old city, uh, which you know now we often call the urban core. Uh, so uh, here's a question I'd like to put to you. Uh, by now, Lots of studies have been done. Books have been written about the post-World War II suburban expansion. Of course, we're looking 50 years back now. We're not looking forward from 1968. Uh, often, the suburban expansion is called uh, white flight. Uh, lots of studies and books have been written about the policies that enabled it, policies including redlining and banking and insurance. Uh, racial restrictions in suburban communities, uh, urban policy around new interstate construction, ongoing issues of school desegregation, etc. So I want to focus this question on uh, the suburbs that were originally outside of uh, the old city. In most metropolitan areas, not all of them, uh, but the faster the suburbs grew, the more the urban tax base declined, the heavier the burdens on core cities became, and the more left behind and betrayed those in the inner city felt. Uh, how do you feel suburban areas at the time, outside of what was the city, uh, the old, we now call the old city, uh, would have fared if Jacksonville and Duval had not consolidated, but had perhaps some other way, reformed their uh, admittedly uh, Byzantine governmental structures. Um, in metropolitan areas where city and county have not consolidated uh, most of the time, the suburbs seem to have done just fine. So uh, what do you guys think? 53% of the people that live in Florida live outside of incorporated areas. Um, look at St. John's County, and that percentage will go from county to county. St. John's is a very high percentage of their county residents live outside of incorporated areas. I think one of the failures, not failures, one of the things that was not anticipated with consolidation was that suddenly, by consolidating, the people outside the normal core city suddenly expected services at a level that you would normally expect in a city, and that was very expensive and continues to be a very expensive thing to do. And so you now, instead of running a garbage service in a, in, a, in a pretty tight area where you're going from this house, this house, this house, now all of a sudden that garbage truck's making a stop every quarter mile. And that becomes a little more expensive to operate in that environment. And that's one thing that I have noticed to what you're saying. I think it would have just evolved, as you said. I think your urban core would have collapsed even more. And, and I have questions about that too. Yeah, and, and I think you'd have seen basically fundamentally what you're seeing in the south part of Duval County and north part of north, St. John's County. They, they, they would have evolved accordingly. What about um, Representative uh, Councilman Bassford? Do you have uh, thoughts about this? Yeah, just short, and I, and I hope this doesn't digress from the current flow of the conversation, but uh, I was in the legislature back during the 60s, and our delegation, we didn't have the sunshine law then, so, but we had a very collegial delegation, even though there was a spread. George Stallings certainly was the conservative member, I'm sure. And, uh, but we worked together very well. It was a very collegial group. And there had been some discussion about uh, fiscal responsibility and uh, duplication of offices, such as the tax collector and the property appraiser. And we had a 1935 uh, state amendment that allowed for consolidation of governments set up by Daughtry Towers over some dispute they were having about uh, law enforcement between the elected sheriff and the appointed chief of police. And uh, 
and I had openly talked about consolidating the uh, tax collector property phrase, and I made some casual men mentions of, of law enforcement. But anyway, um, um, along came the Yates Manifesto calling for consolidated government and, and uh, things. So we started working on it, and they dumped it on me to put a study committee uh, statute together. And uh, I checked and found that uh, Nashville had done it, but they had something like 50 or 57 council members, and I didn't think uh, Jacksonville would be very amenable <laughs> to that. It's bad enough when and, I uh, and then there was the Tampa Hillsbury uh, vote at one time, and Terrell Sessoms was a member of the legislature that I knew from University of Florida who had been president of the student body, and his brother had, and I had been close in politics there. And so I talked to Terrell about what they did, and uh, he helped me with it, and we started an open discussion thinking more along the terms of, of what these other two towns had done and going in opposite directions. And uh, we were able to get some good discussion going in the delegation, and then they sort of told me to get the draft together uh, for them to consider. And, and we did, and uh, there were some changes made. Uh, one I recall was Tommy Green uh, recommended that we each have so many appointments to the study committee, and uh, that seemed to be adaptable and, and some other stuff. Uh, we'd done, I, I had worked on the uh, Port Authority bill and been assigned to work that up. And uh, so anyway, uh, what we ended up with was we uh, had each appointed seven members to the study committee, and uh, two of mine, strangely enough, went in opposite directions during the, the uh, consolidation proposition uh, when it went to a vote of the people in 68. And so uh, uh, Earl Johnson, uh, I had put on there as the secretary of the executive committee mm -hmm. of the study commission, and I had Bill Birchfield on there, and, uh, and then we unanimously agreed on a uh, president, uh, chairman of the uh, executive committee to put the final thing out there. And so uh, we got that passed. In fact, uh, Jack Matthews, our senator at the time, who was a great guy, uh, introduced it in the Senate. And we had good support, of course. And, uh, and then we had that study committee put together, and they came up with what is essentially what we have today, the form of government. Well, Penny pinching me, I wasn't too happy about the size because I was advocating more for saving the taxpayer money rather than enlarging. I knew a larger government would do that, so I didn't get on board to uh, support the final vote. And uh, as you know, that went very much against me. And I was at the time, by that time, I was chairman of the county commission. But, um, but, but I wasn't one of the thieves in the old government. Because, uh, <laughs> Well, after I got out of office in 87, I'd served as the interim after the property appraiser got uh, in, uh, indicted. Uh, the governor, uh, Bob Graham, appointed me to fill out the term. And after that, I was sitting in my office one day, uh, happily kicked out of politics probably because I could practice law for a change. And this guy came over named Rick Beasler and said he'd like to see me. And so my secretary got me to take him in. And, and she didn't know what he wanted, and I didn't know what he wanted. And he says, well, it's not, when I asked him what I could do for him, he says, not what you can do for me, it's what I can do for you. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I'm here to apologize. And I said, apologize for what? And he said, well, I'm chief investigator for the state attorney's office. I said, oh my God, what have I done now? <laughs> and he says, and we had a list of working up of people we might have uh, charge or indict, and uh, and he said, and when I didn't see your name on the list, I asked my boss why uh, your name wasn't on the list, and he says, because you won't get anything on him. He said, I'll bet I can, and so his boss gave him unlimited authority, but his boss also told him, said, when you lose the vote, I mean, when you lose your uh, your uh, bet with me, you have to go to Basford and apologize to his face. <laughs> and I said, I said, you mean you're the guy that chased down the mail lady and checking all the court records and any property I own or anything else. He said, yeah, I am. And I said, hmm. And, you know, 
And uh, I thank this boss for letting him do it because I can, I've got someone still alive today that can prove it. <laughs> Me, well, I moved to Clay County because I knew no one was electing anything out there because I was so addicted that it was, it was financially suffering. And um, so one day this Beasler comes by my office and I didn't know, he said, well, he says, I just want to be here, to be, you be one of the first ones to know that I'm running for sheriff down here and, and I don't want you against me. And uh, I said, are you here for money? And he said, well, I won't turn it down if you will. So I gave him a little money and uh, he so, retired this past time and, and uh, we elected him uh, so, as so, so, sheriff. So all of that is great, but I still am wondering, um, how do you think the, the suburbs outside the, uh, the old city would have fared if... Nobody uh, wants to talk about this much, but there was a certain amount of racism involved in the final vote. Really? Because <laughs> Jacksonville was going to have a black government. Okay. There's no question that the minority would eventually be able to elect people to what they wanted instead of sitting on the sidelines and, and, uh, and suffering for it. And um, so... Uh, they didn't want Jacksonville to become a black controlled government. So, so, so I have questions about that too, but does that mean that the suburbs, those... They uh, didn't want Jacksonville to be black governed. And they would have fared okay, you yeah. think, if consolidation had not happened? Well... Mr. Gulliford is shaking, is nodding I, I, his head I, yes. I, 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 that like you mentioned, uh, <laughs> Matt mentioned, that uh, uh, Earl Johnson could have easily been the first okay. black mayor. And, and I want to come to that in just a yeah. second. Um, what about uh, uh, Council Members uh, Williams or Dickinson? Do you have any thoughts about how the, uh, the suburbs, the um, communities outside of the old city would have done if consolidation did not happen? Well, I represented the beaches. Uh-huh. And it was a pleasure doing that. I had a stroke this year. It, it hurt my mind. You know, I lost my balance. But I can't remember a lot of things. But we did have a good government, and I did enjoy Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so I want to, uh, so yeah, yeah, go ahead, Mr. Carlucci. Well, the, the question that you asked, for, first I want to say what a, it's an honor for me to be here in, uh, with so many people that my daddy worked with. And, and I, I yeah. respect each and every one of these uh, gentlemen. Uh, I don't think my daddy uh, worked with uh, Councilman Gold. I was much too uh, young. But, um, you keep saying. You might, you might have been. I'm reinforcing something but here. I, I, I've been fortunate to work with uh, Councilman Gulliford as, as well. But I, I wanted to say that because this government was built, um, though not perfect, by Mr. Dickinson, Mr. Williams, Mr. Basford, and some of the others uh, that built this government. So much of the structure is still there that we use to this day. Now. To answer your question, that this this is a how would the suburbs have fared compared to the city? We might not ever know the answer to that question. Earl Johnson uh, is one of the great stories of city government in Jacksonville. He was a black uh, civil rights lawyer. He represented Martin Luther King. He studied under Thurgood Marshall. He was the lawyer for the desegregation cases in Jacksonville and in Florida. And he's, I mean, he's got a storied background. Everybody reckoned and knew that he would be the first mayor of pre-consolidated Jacksonville had we not consolidated. And I don't know the quote exactly, but what the, but I, but I can tell you the spirit of his quote. And his quote at the time was, we, need to do not what's just best for the black community. We need to do what's best for the entire community. Boy, could we use statesmanship like that again in this whole wide world? And I'm going to tell you, Earl Johnson, and we're going to tell the story about Earl Johnson uh, this Monday night. But I wanted to say that about Earl Johnson because he and Sally Mathis, they were the two strongest. And when my wife and I got married, Sally was so dear, and she gave my wife and I a Bible. And we still have that Bible to this day. Uh, but but I wanna, this is what I want to say. is If we had not consolidated and we still had the old city, 
whatever color leadership in the county, whatever color leadership. See, before consolidation, we didn't have any one person who spoke for Jacksonville. But when we went to consolidated government, we had what they call a strong mayoral form of government. Now, that's not to suggest that the council's weak and can't, you know, play its role on the legislative side. But suddenly, we had somebody where the buck kind of stopped. So, Hans Tansler could speak to the whole city. And what his legacy was, was cleaning up the St. John's River. And then Jay Godpole spoke to the whole community and said, we need to do something with downtown. And not everything worked out, but he had the right idea. And he was a cheerleader for Jacksonville. And he brought 50,000 crazy football fans in the middle of the Gator Bowl. Y'all remember that? Yep. When Baltimore Colts came and Buddy Ursay jumped out of the helicopter. But, but see, we never had this before consolidation because we didn't have one strong voice. So after God bowled, then came Tommy Azuri. He spoke to the community. He says, we've got to do something about the odor in the air. We've got to do something about the tolls. He eliminated that. But he was able to, but he had to go to the whole community and talk to the whole community. And then from Tommy, you went to John Delaney. At Austin, at Austin, I'm sorry. At Austin, well, okay. River City Renaissance, that the city finally started to get a little money and we had River City Renaissance. And that was the 25th year of consolidation. And he built uh, he, he, he redid the, the old Gator Bowl and made some vast improvements in the downtown and in the suburbs areas uh, in water and sewer. But he also got the Jaguars here. Okay, then you move forward from uh, Ed Austin, then to John Payton. No, 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 John Delaney. John Delaney, we got a lot of mayors, I'm telling you, a lot of them are Johns too. It's hard to keep up with them all. So John Delaney, he gets into office, and of course what he's known for is the Better Jacksonville Plan, which is one of the most vast improvements of Jacksonville's infrastructure and the arena, uh, the library, um, the courthouse. Uh, I say that lightly because that was not a popular project, but, but the state requires counties to build their own courthouse. But the better Jacksonville plan made Jacksonville a better place. And then after him, John Payton, and, and John Payton, unfortunately, the economy started to dip on John, but John had to do some tough decisions in raising some taxes, because you cannot run a city on the cheap. Sometimes you've got to raise some taxes to, right. to take care of the public health and welfare. And he had the courage to do that. And he also did the Jacksonville journey. And then after, John Payton came Alvin Brown, I think. Alvin was one term. Nobody in our history came, so, came from so little to become a mayor of a big city like Jackson, like Alvin Brown did. And he's a good man. Alvin brought a lot of excitement to Jacksonville. He brought the Downtown Investment Authority. Uh, he brought some improvements to the Brooklyn area. So he had some things that he did, but he was struggling with not much money. And then he did not get reelected. Lenny Curry got, uh, got, got elected. He went to the community, the delegation first, with his considerable influence in Tallahassee, and was able to put on the ballot the half cent sales tax to eliminate or to eventually eliminate our uh, unfunded liability for the pension. I say all that to say this, you could have never done that in pre-consolidation, and pre-consolidation, I don't know if we would have had the Jaguars. I don't know right. if we would have had a lot of those things that I was talking about. So, so you um, anticipated a couple of my other questions, and I want to get everybody a chance, but I also want to get to, no, so, so I'll, I'll get your point, but real quickly, uh, so the reason for my asking that question about um, you know, uh, the county that was at the time of consolidation outside the old city is because most 
uh, metropolitan areas did not choose consolidation. Uh, and not all of them, but most of them, the suburbs have done, well, you know, pretty well. So I wanted to ask about that before I asked about uh, the effects on the core city. Um, but, you know, I, I think one thing that um, uh, what, you, what you've said really highlights is that at the time when uh, so much was wrong in the 1960s, schools discredited, uh, you know, the, the, all of our waterways full of raw sewage. I mean, the city, frankly, stunk. Uh, you know, it, it had to have felt like uh, only a really dramatic step uh, can uh, make us feel any better about ourselves. Like moving to the beach? Yeah. Like moving to the beach. <laughs> so I want to get your point, and then, I want, and then I have to, for the sake of time, and to get some other questions in, I have to, uh, have to shift real quickly. Yeah, this is a quick point. Uh, okay. Talking about the, uh, the football team, uh, the other thing was, and this happened right at consolidation, and it was the most important thing we had going, and that was all of the pollution we had in mm. Walter and yes. Bill Bassett and all them remembered. What happened was, is along came the Federal Clean Water Act. And we had hundreds, well not hundreds, but we had tons of private, little private water and sewer utilities all over town. And we needed, we needed to address that because it was all in the river. And so what we did was, uh, we applied to the federal government and we found out that we could get 75 cents on every dollar that we spent to clean up the utility, uh, clean up the city. So what we did is we went out and bought every, just about every utility in town. We paid through the nose for some of them, more than we should have. But in addition to that, we created these regional water and sewer treatment plants, which we have today. And that's the big reason we were able to clean that up. That was one of the main features that we had going. And Hans Tanzler often said that, you know, all mayors build something to themselves, but his only, the thing that he built while he was mayor was go, all going to be underground because it was a water and sewer treatment plant. That's right. But it was very, very important that we collectively uh, have access to that federal money at that time. So I want to comment on, on okay. right Okay, real, um, real quickly, yes. When I became president of the city council, the go-to man that I found and contributed so much along the way to the fiscal responsibility of this community and, and, and someone that I knew would tell me the truth about what was going on with the budgets and the money was spent and stuff like that. And, and that was through the years. And of course, his follow-up was Richard Wallace, who also did a good job. But, but, but Bob Johnson has played a bigger part in all of this than people normally would even care about. Uh, but he was there for you. He was there for you. Thank you for that. <laughs> and so, a beach resident to boot, right? I apologize. <laughs> so look, I, I think we also have to acknowledge that uh, historical forces are complicated. Governmental forces are complicated. We can talk about what happens locally, governmentally, but you know we also talk about uh, national, you know, federal initiatives and state initiatives and changes uh, in in uh, the culture. You know, changes in the culture about how people think about the environment, about race, different things like that. Um, so. And I want to come back to uh, Missouri and uh, the smell of the city and so on in a minute. But I, want to, I, I don't want to go there yet. I want to just focus on um, a question at a time. Uh, and uh, this is going to be the most uncomfortable question that I have for you guys. Um, and you've all pretty much <laughs> anticipated it. So I think we'd be remiss if we um, didn't talk about uh, the... Uh, the way that consolidation has been criticized, rightly or wrongly, and questioned more than any other uh, concern, and I think that has to do with race relations. Uh, a number of community members actually contacted me personally about this topic in the last week. Uh, this past week, the Times Union's Matt Sorgel wrote about Earl Johnson, whom Mr. Carlucci uh, mentioned earlier, about his role in consolidation. Uh, and uh, of course, Earl Johnson uh, supported consolidation at the time uh, of the vote. There's long been a sentiment 
in the black community, the majority of which I recognize did vote for consolidation, that Johnson might have been mayor if consolidation had not occurred, and a feeling that consolidation diluted black political power. Uh, Sorgo writes, uh, Johnson acknowledged that in the troubled 1960s he had thought that a majority black Jacksonville would struggle to succeed, but times had changed, and perhaps he thought a black city would have turned out just fine. In the early 1990s at a UNF conference, uh, Betty Holzendorf directly stated, just quoting her where she was coming from, that consolidation had made things worse for the black community. Even more pointedly, is this quote from Nate Monroe's Times Union story this last week that I know we all saw. <laughs> uh, former mayor, and he's uh, quoting uh, Pastor R.L. Gundy. Lou Ritter was sitting in my office. I said, Lou, they consolidated this government to keep blacks out of power. He said, Gundy, you're right. However, each of you wants to discuss this point. I think it's incumbent upon us that we recognize uh, this panel contains no black representation. And appreciate Johnson's statement, quote, I don't think the white counterpoint of Earl Johnson quite understands the black experience. Having said all that, I recognize uh, that consolidation was and remains deeply complicated, and I'm going to ask you about other components of it as well, uh, but this prompt does represent uh, perhaps consolidation's biggest negative perception, and I think perhaps a perception that has grown since 1968. Having said all of that, who wants to go first? Yes, yes. We had four 19 city councilmen vote against the consolidation. True. And, and, and Sally Mathis supported consolidation, and Mary Singleton opposed consolidation. I sat next to Mary Singleton. Yeah, right. You know. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Culliford. I want to. I want to start off by reminding everybody here that in the time that I've sat on the council, we have elected two black members to the city council at large. Think about that. Two times. And I think that made a strong statement to, to the community. Um, and I think in a lot of ways we are moving in the right direction. Is, are there still problems? Absolutely. I mean, I see it in the core city, it's a problem. Years ago when I was selling, I had a construction equipment business and we sold a particular brand of equipment that was utilized by counties and cities. And I remember riding, we sold one to Gadsden County north of, of Tallahassee. And I was riding with the chairman of the county commission when we delivered the machine. And he was telling me his biggest problem in that county was that 70% of the residential properties were not on the tax rolls because of homestead exemption. If you think about what would have happened had the core city, had there not been consolidation, I'd submit to you that I think it would have been worse off than it is today because I think, frankly, the revenue would not have been there to support the need because you have to look and, and realize that in the core city, typically your properties or more de your property values are more depressed. Consequently, I think you would have a substantial, a large and substantial number of properties that would be paying no property tax. And of course, and, we, we know that that's the case. Now, and, and, and that actually was happening and was part of what led to exactly. high schools being discredited. Sure. And at, at the that time. time, remember, I can remember folks riding on a bus when I was in high school where black people still sat in the back of the bus. It always confounded me. I never, I never quite understood that as a young kid growing up. You were just coming out of segregation. I mean, it wasn't that far back before, we're, before consolidation came along. There was still a mindset, let's be real. Absolutely, there was a mindset in the community still and had the other component of that had you not done something and had you evolved to a black-led government. I think you'd have seen even more white flight outside of the core city, further making it more difficult to have the revenues necessary to prop city up. You've seen that repeated in other metropolitan areas throughout the country. I mean, Detroit is the one that jumps out at you immediately, but you know, I, I don't think that you can absolutely say that consolidation was detrimental to the core. I think it's an issue unto itself, the urban core. And I can tell you something else, folks. 
This is an issue for the whole community, what's going on in the urban core, because the crime, the crime there's no barriers, except maybe the ditch out here, there are no barriers to keep bad people limited to the urban core. And we're starting to see that more and more, and we're hearing about it in other metropolitan cities like Atlanta, about what's happening out in the suburbs as far as the spread of crime. Um, it's not just an urban core problem, it's a city problem, community I'd, problem. I'd, I'd like to kind of... Yeah, oh, absolutely, we will, absolutely. Um, I, but I'd like to follow that up uh, real quickly um, to, um, again, uh, note that we have no um, black representation on this panel and ask if we can kind of try to uh, think about where Earl Johnson was coming from at that time, where Betty Holtzendorf was coming from, where uh, per perhaps uh, black community members now who feel this way about consolidation are coming from. And I also want to address the fact that, uh, you know, nationally there is a trend that young people are moving back into the cities and Jacksonville is a little bit behind on that. Uh, it's certainly not uh, as far ahead as cities in the Pacific Northwest or uh, even Portland, Maine or Austin, Texas or a number of other places. But, you know, uh, everything about the, the uh, urban core being negative is really kind of 25 years behind where a lot of young people are now. But uh, Mr. Carlucci, you had your hand up. Well, uh, Earl Johnson Jr. can speak to this issue better than anybody. Uh, in Jacksonville, we have a uh, task force on the 50th anniversary consolidation, and uh, I co-chair, and Earl co-chairs. And so that's diversity right there. Uh, and one of the things that we did, because of the very issue you're talking about, and, and what Bill Bastard had talked about, there, there was a slice of this community that did not want black uh, leadership in the city. You cannot deny that, that that happened. But I think it was a slice. It was not the whole piece of the puzzle because of the crisis. But it kept coming back to this. The city needed to consolidate because they had to recapture all of the Avalon taxes that were going out to the, to the uh, county uh, that had left the city. And so, no matter what you would have done, the, the, the decor was going down. So I'm not sure they had really much of a choice, and I think that's one of the reasons Earl Johnson made the comment like he did. And I, and I will say there's nobody that doesn't sometimes, well, there's a lot of people that don't pay attention to government at all, and I, I get that. But, but people that do, and students of government, will oftentimes think about, you know, was consolidation the best way or was or, or could have been done better. There's pluses and minuses. I think the pluses outweigh the minuses. But but in Jacksonville, when we put this task force together, we went and we got the involvement of the NAACP, the Southern Christian Leadership Council, the Jacksonville Urban League, and they have played a big role. No voices have been silenced because I said earlier the con the conversation goes on. You can't. You should never silence voices. First of all, we all know that. But even if you tried, the conversation is still going to go on. And so, you know, I noticed that too. There's, there's no black members up here. But, but I did want to say in Jacksonville, we have gone, we have worked hard to include the black membership of our community. And, and, and one other thing I think that needs to be said, and this is not elective, but it's, it's, it's an important part of being mayor in Jacksonville, is your appointment ability, the power of appointment. And I believe, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, this mayor, Lenny Curry, has more department heads uh, that are from the black community uh, and more black appointees, at least, than any mayor, I think, henceforth. And so that speaks to the, to the reaching out uh, to, to try to, to, to make our city government more reflective of what the whole community looks like. And, uh, but uh, I should have given my spot up to Earl Johnson because I'll tell you, nobody can tell the story like Earl Johnson 
Jr. can, other than maybe his daddy, Earl Johnson Sr. But I think your point's well taken, and, and that is a point of sensitivity uh, in the community. And it, uh, let, let, let me ask this follow-up, and then we'll, we'll, we can switch gears. Okay. Uh, and that is, um, I'd like to know how, how people on the panel think about um, basic services on, let's say, the northwest side of Jacksonville compared to uh, communities that would have been outside the old city, uh, let's say, you know, Mandarin or the area around the St. John's uh, Town Center and uh, what your thoughts are on that. Somebody might say we just have crummy services everywhere, you know. Um, I've, I get, we get complaints, John and I can talk to you about garbage service and we get complaints from all over the all Those over people the probably don't live on the, the northwest side though. Yeah, well, exactly, but I mean we get it, it it's widespread and that's, that's an issue unto itself that's, that's manifested itself lately. I mean we have a, we have a significant problem with um, septic tanks, but when you look at the map of the city, locating all the septic tanks in the city, you suddenly realize it's not just a northwest Jacksonville problem. You find it in Mandarin, you find it the intersection of uh, University and Atlantic, all that area around in there, those neighborhoods, all on septic tanks. Big problem, $200 million problem to fix it. Um, I think that there's been a focus by this county to try to enhance services in, in the Northwest Quadrant. I think that when Denise Lee headed up that blight committee, we all recognized that picking up litter in the Northwest part of the community was more important than picking up litter maybe in the Mandarin area. Um, uh, because it's, you're trying to make an impression, and that's, that's, that's important. Um, but it's, it's, still, it's still a significant problem. We recognize that. You know what else is interesting? I don't know how many of you all know where Durkeyville is. Durkeyville is a, was a predominantly African-American middle-class neighborhood, and you could, huh? Poor, poor now, but not then. Not back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, because this is where professional African-Americans who were professional and who were business owners lived. It was also the site, though, of one of the city's first public housing projects. So well, there was significant poverty in the area back then, too. No, no, that was not, no, you're not right about that. Yeah. Uh, hang, hang, hang on. But let, let me finish, let me, right, let, let me finish about Durkeyville, because I've spent time in Durkeyville. Sure. If you took the housing stock of Durkeyville and dropped it down in San Marco, I guarantee you, you could sell those houses very easily, because they were very well-built houses. And so Durkeyville was a pretty nice neighborhood up through the 60s. And then in the 70s, it started in decline. And why? That might have been a byproduct to some degree of integration. Because kids, these, these professional and business owners sent their kids off to college, and the kids came back, the parents expected them, well, you're going to move back into the neighborhood. No, I'm not. I'm going to move to Mandarin. I'm going to move here. I'm going to move there. So suddenly, these houses ended up the parents were deceased, the kids get them, they're living in Atlanta, they don't want to, they try to rent them, they, you know, the, the neighborhood starts into decline. Jim Overton put on a little session at Dallas Graham Library that I attended several years ago and a number of Durkeyville residents there and I still remember one lady showing me how much her property value had, or assessed value had declined over about a 10 year period. See, it started that momentum as far as a neighborhood in decline. And even though the housing stocks were good and still are good, it, it, was, the, it was the complexion in the neighborhood that changed and went from home ownership to heavy rental, slumlords and the like, and that just caused the decline to go even greater. And you see that repeated, but it's more vivid in Durkeyville than anywhere else in the Northwest Quadrant, I think. But, How do you turn it around? But, but, but there's also the perception in the uh, poor areas, areas of Jacksonville, both white and black. Uh, and I can remember uh, driving over and meeting with a group at 44th and Boulevard. And I got out of my truck and there was about 15 people there and I spoke with them. I said, tell me what you think about Jacksonville. Well, see, just to make a long story short, they felt disconnected. 
they did not feel that Jacksonville was reaching out to them. And I said, well, what about that illegal dumping down there? That, that the Indian, have you ever called 630 City? And they said, nah, we don't call it because they won't do nothing about it. And so I called 630 City when I left. I came back a week later, it was gone. But it's the perception. Sure. And it's the reality. Right. But there's a lot of perceptions there. We've got to do a better job of reaching and gaining trust in those areas that if we say we want to do something, we're going to do it. And battling perception is probably the hardest thing for an elected official or a mother or father or anybody who's leading a, an organization to do. Perception's hard to overcome. And, uh, but, but here's the thing. There are services that remain that are needed in the urban core, the northwest quadrant, and we need to be able to do two things at one time. We need, and I hope this is what happens after October 1st, that we will regain that civic pride that the gentlemen like Walter Dickinson, Walter Williams, Bill Basford, Bob Johnson, these giants who built this consolidated government, and we will go back and we will correct those problems but we can still reach into the future to make this a greater city. We can do two things at one time. We can do that. We've done it before. And so uh, it, it, there's a truth to what you're talking about, and it needs correction, and it, it, needs, it needs a writing of the course. But there's a lot of things that have been done that just can't quite break through that perception that were done in the Better Jacksonville Plan, River City Renaissance, and so forth. So it's complicated. It's very, co and it takes communication. It yeah, it takes communication. And um, so you know, I I I want to express that uh, you know people's perceptions, depending on where they are, what their lives are, what their worldviews are. Uh, you know, I I, I want to try to uh, fairly represent different kinds of perceptions uh, from the community in these questions. And uh, you know there are plenty of people in our community who would who would say that you know I should be asking much harder questions than I am. So I just want to want to acknowledge that. Um, I do want to say so. Mr. Carlucci has mentioned uh, a couple times the event on October first. <laughs> so there is this event. Uh, you want to tell us about that real quickly at the Hayden Burns Library? Real quickly, and I think Mr. Actually, Carlucci the Jesse Baldy Dupont Center now. He Sorry to say, and I don't want to get interrupt that, but. October 1st at the old Hayden Burns Library, which is now the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund building. It's been cleaned up, it's beautiful, and Steve is gonna hand out uh, some invitations. And I just would like to invite everybody. There's gonna be free valet parking. There's gonna be, it's a free public event. Um, and, and it's gonna be, I think, a very touching and a very inspirational time. And then you'll get to hear Earl Johnson speak. I'll tell you, he is one of the great orators I've ever heard. Now, Rick Mullaney's good. Rick Mullaney, how many have heard, have heard Rick Mullaney talk before? He's a great orator, but he's kind of like a machine gun. I he's very quick. You know, Earl Johnson's like a violin. You know, he's slow, but he picks out the right words and the right notes. He's, he's a wonderful young man. I think he's a young man. He's 53. That's young. That's real young. Uh, but... Uh, but I hope that uh, y'all, I just wanted to make sure that you had an invite. If you'd like to come, just RSVP by a phone number or, or email, and it is free, and I think you will enjoy it. So let me uh, switch directions here. A okay. uh, couple of you have talked about uh, Mayor Hazuri's administration and uh, what that administration did for, well, um, the air in Jacksonville. How many of you guys, curious, how many people in the audience remember when maybe Jacksonville didn't smell so good? Right. <laughs> so uh, I want to use that to uh, ask a more general question. It could be answered a number of different ways. Uh, and that is, uh, and, and, and again, I would like to you know, spread the discussion out amongst our panel. Uh, but how has consolidation affected how this metropolitan area deals with environmental issues? Uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, Mr. Basford, would you like to start us off with it? Yeah, I'll tell you, uh, I'm down on Doctors Lake and we have lots of algae bloom down there. <laughs> um, but I think, I think the, the central effort 
is trying to do what they can and go in the right direction. Um, the one thing about it, you know, having a, 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 a powerful mayor, uh, the council, of course, is there with the purse strings, and they, that's one of the good things. And um, but there are so many issues that you just can't wave a magic wand and say you can do it. And uh, and and this uh, environmental thing, uh, um, I like to see that we have a Hannah Park and and we have the uh, parks around Jacksonville that are still and to drive by Fletcher a while ago and see all the kids out there playing soccer and and uh, and the families involved and everything. I I was very impressed and. And those are pleasant moments. I'm 88 years old. I was born in 1930, so I went through all this. I went into the Navy in, in, in my senior year in high school and was going to hell in a handbasket. And a cousin from World War II steered me into the Navy, and, it, and uh, I got my GID, uh, uh, GED and, and um, started junior college even before. In fact, my son left. He was here. I was born in 52. Uh, my oldest boy in 51, so um, they were born when I was in the Navy, and I got out in 52 right after uh, the Korean thing. And, and But there, that's why I've been so addicted to politics. It hit me hard as a kid with my dad and in college at the University of Florida. And, and, um, and but I love, I was born in Jacksonville, and in a, a rather poor community over at MacDuff and Beaver in that area. And uh, I just, um, my involvement with interracial things came early in my life. Uh, we played in a field back there where some of the black kids were two blocks to the dividing line on Canal Street there. And us, because nobody could afford a football, we used dried up cow dung. And the guy that got a, caught a pass usually yeah, I suffered through that, <laughs> but but uh, it just um, life is it was real for me, and I joined the Navy to see the world, of course, and I end up being shipped to NS Jacks. <laughs> and, uh, and I did spend some time in Gitmo. You you, you yeah. came full circle. <laughs> yes, but I, it, I, I wonder. But I love I love my Jacksonville, and and uh, I only moved to Clay County, like I told you, is because I knew not enough people knew me to like me anything. But when I, well, your when secret's I, out now. When I see yeah. the algae and... and, uh, and Better move back to Jacksonville. We don't have algae around here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what <laughs> about... Know, uh, you uh, send uh, it all down to St. John's to us. But, uh, Mr. Williams, Mr. Dickinson, do you guys have yeah. thoughts about how consolidation um, affected how we deal with environmental issues? Whether that be... Uh, you know, uh, the state of the river at the time or the state of the air, you know, on into his, uh, Mr. Hazuri's administration? Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. No, it's all right. It's, uh, you know, I don't want anybody to feel like they're, they're not included. Um, any other thoughts from sure. the panel? Yeah. I don't wanna I don't wanna hog this. Matt and I were talking about we seem to be dominant. We're not trying to be, but of course the closeness to it. You know, um, Lori Boyer told me yesterday that there was a race in the St. John's River. It's some sponsored event that goes to a bunch of different venues. Uh, it was this weekend. Uh, as part of the race, they have to test water quality. She said our water quality report came back incredibly good bunch better than in a lot of other venues that they swim in or other places around the country. I think sometimes it's a matter of perception, just like downtown's unsafe, um, but when you look at it statistically, it's not. The water quality in St. John's River is obviously much, much, much better. Is that attributable to consolidation? Well, maybe in a to a degree with respect to the formation of independent authorities to address specific issues. Now, you may have warm feelings about JEA or not so warm feelings about JEA, but I think the consolidation of the water and sewer uh, systems under JEA's management and operation was probably a good move, a strong move, and led to um, 
better water quality, better air quality as, as a consequence. And I think that, um, that the whole structure, and these gentlemen know better, Bob Johnson and, and, and all of them that were involved, the whole formation of independent authorities. Again, while we might have some difficulties with them currently, the theory behind it seems to work pretty doggone well and has worked pretty well and I think the results are are obvious when you look at reports like Lori Boyer was talking about. Okay, so um, we, we're getting kind of close on time. Um, I have two quick questions I want to ask and then I want to open it to the audience for, for a minute, but Mr. Carlucci, you wanted to make a point. Well, just real quickly, the stem of the river is in pretty good shape except down where it does have algae blooms. And we do get them in Duval County too, at times when it's hot and so forth. But where the, the, the water quality problems are so prevalent is in our tributaries. Yeah. The tributaries are the problems and that's usually they are on the first receiving end of the failing septic tanks. Uh, I, I think this council in particular, Councilman Guller for this council and, and, and Boyer and uh, Crescent Benny have done a good job of addressing and getting in place uh, septic tank remediation. I think in the next 10 years, you will see a, uh, Jackson will be a completely different city in terms of its, its water quality and its tributaries. I, I, okay. It just hasn't taken place yet. Now, one, one other little thing. You can run a water line down a city street, but then the city pays for that but then the people that live on that street have to pay to hook up. Well, you know, everybody wants, septic, wants to get rid of their septic tank, but then when they have to hook up, it can be anywhere from five to ten to fifteen thousand dollars to hook up. So that is where sometimes the rub is, and and there are solutions that this present council has come up with to make that easier to hook up. But and I, and I believe that those solutions will work. I think 10, 15 years from now, uh, our river will be even cleaner because the tributaries are being addressed. Okay, we'll ask you about that again. 15 years? <laughs> um, this uh, is a question comes from the community. It's two part. Uh, one of the selling points for consolidation was greater governmental efficiency. Obviously, the governmental structures that it replaced were at best cumbersome and at worst, nourished corruption and cronyism. Uh, unless anybody wants to take exception to that, it's doubtful, but you know, perhaps. Uh, but here's a question from this, this uh, individual. Uh, it's actually a couple parts to it. Did consolidation actually lower the cost of government? That's the first part. What costs did consolidation accrue, which actually a couple of you have mentioned earlier, such as extending sewage and public utilities, urban renewal programs, et cetera, and uh, this is word for word from this individual from the community. How could you ever answer these questions since so many mayoral administrations have consistently lowered millage rates? I would let Bob Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think that would be the perfect person to start this. <laughs> Take that one for you, wait, please. <laughs> What's that? Well, first of all, it's, it's, if Matt, if somebody mentioned it to start, you know, this duplication of, excuse me, <laughs> the duplication of services was very, very evident. Uh, you know, you had two tax collectors, you had two property appraisers, you had, uh, you had a, uh, you had a city police department, you had the sheriff's office, you had many, many duplications in county and city government. And uh, there's no question in my mind that we had a lot of, uh, of, uh, of cons uh, you know, of savings from that, from just that. And, uh, but, you know, there have been many, many attempts. And you can come up with, with numbers that, you know, I, if you go to a county that uh, has a city and a county like Tampa, Tampa tried to consolidate, but they didn't because they couldn't see the efficiencies of it. I think that anybody who has ever, and we've had many, many cities uh, come to our city since we uh, consolidated, and they all went away with a real good feeling about it. But as far as just putting numbers, I just think there's no question in my mind uh, that, that it's been much more efficient in government. And the thing about it is, is, is where the efficiencies come in too, is in dealing with governmental agencies, the federal government. 
you know, in, in getting the grants and everything, I mean, cities and counties fight each other all the That's time. Right. You take in uh, Broward County, it's got 27 cities. They're forever suing each other and suing the counties. Uh, Dade County has got 39 cities, and they're forever. They've got a park metro, but they're always suing each other, and we don't have it. The only problem we had was with the beaches, and I think we, I hope we, I hope we <laughs> saw. The only problem we have is with the beaches. You have the next oh, lawsuit, Johnson. Seconds for him. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, I'm what, ready. What, what, I'm what what about, ready to rock and roll again. <laughs> what about the last part of that question, which, and this again, this is word for word, word for word from an individual from the community. Uh, it says, how could you ever answer these questions since so many mayoral administrations have consistently lowered millage rates? Uh, what about cool. that? I don't see the correlation with that. No, I, I, I think the thinking, and this is reflected uh, in Jim Crooks's book, Jacksonville, the Consolidation Story as well, is that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, government costs money and that uh, millage rates have consistently gone down. I, it's not my argument. I'm just well, 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 putting it to you guys. Well, well wait a minute. If, if you're confusing efficiency with cost, you, you really can't do that. I would agree with Bob. It's more efficient, but as I, the point I made earlier, when suddenly the consolidated government was faced with providing municipal services in a county environment, their cost of operation for that particular activity went up. So right. you may make an argument for efficiency. What's the measuring stick for cost? Well, I would submit to you that certainly a big one is property taxes. If you look around the state and you combine the property tax assessment in Orange County and add it to the city of Orlando, the millage that they charge, you find out that their combined millage is lower than the millage rate that we're charging in Jacksonville right now. Not much, but a little bit. And, but there are other factors too. For instance, we get a significant contribution from, this, from JEA each year that represents a couple of mills in value, and, and they get other sources of revenue. That's why you can't make an exact comparison just based on property tax comparisons. Um, but I think it's more efficient. I think if we sold it as a real cost savings, that was inaccurate. That's right. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, Any follow-up to that? I would just add one thing, and that is uh, in some of the years I was on the council, uh, we reduced the millage rate, and Councilman Overton can talk to this very well because he was the property appraiser but because growth was going on and property taxes were going up on people's homes we were able to reduce the millage rate and still collect more money uh, and there was a lot of pressure to do that but as I look at it now um, you know and I think most council members and mayors back in those days would probably admit that was a nice luxury to have but it wasn't very forward-thinking because you cannot build a city on the cheap. And I, I can qualify this because anytime I've run for office, I've never run on a no new tax pledge because you never know when you might need a tax to leverage something great for the city, like the Jaguars maybe. Uh, or you may run into an emergency like John Payton did at the time, just trying to take care of the public health and welfare and he had to raise taxes. And so uh, we've got to grow up a bit in that degree, in that department, and, and realize to be more forward thinking into what our costs are going to be. I, I can only tell you our costs are only going to get greater because the city's getting bigger. And I, and, and I think that is, uh, is something that, that uh, if we're going to be a great city, we got a low tax base. We're in the lowest tax places in the world, but you can't convince your constituents of that all the time. But, you know, that government, I've served three terms on the council. I'm 62. I'm a grown man, and I'm just going to tell you, sometimes you've got to have money to pay for services. And I'll never forget, my dear old dad was, was chairman of finance the year before he ran for state senate. And my daddy could do this. Now, I, I couldn't do it, but he could do it. He was finance committee chairman, and he raised the millage rate by two mills. Right. Is that right, Bob? Yes. And everybody said, Eric Smith and, and John Forbes are going to hang that around your neck when you run for Senate, and you're going to lose. 
And my dad looked at him and said, well, so be it. But if people want services, they got to pay for them. Right. And, and my daddy had a way of talking like a stick of dynamite that got lit. And people agreed with him. And so he beat them on. He was elected. He would. He got. To, he was elected on the first. On the first vote, he beat two incumbents that were in the House of Representatives uh, for the state senate. Now, if we could edit this tape to take all that tax talk I just made out, <laughs> no, I'm only teasing. I'm just, just teasing. But it, it's a sensitive subject. But we've got to get over it. We've got to learn that that we we've got to invest. It's not it's not raising taxes necessarily. It's but you don't want to raise taxes to, to balance the checkbook. But if you've got to raise taxes to invest in your city to make it better for your children and, 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 and your grandchildren, we should do that. So we're, you know, we're still with the discussion of realities and perceptions. You know? uh, I have one more question for you guys, and then I want to uh, ask the audience what questions uh, they might have. Here's my last question. In 1967, the local media, especially uh, WJXT, with uh, the programs they ran that led to the grand jury and number of indictments, uh, and the Florida Times Union, and more than any other journalist, the excellent writer Richard Martin uh, held enormous influence on community thinking regarding consolidation. J.J. Daniel, uh, biggest advocate of consolidation, took over ownership of the Times Union, the Jacksonville Journal. My question then is twofold. One, uh, what do you think the role of the news media should be toward local government? And secondly, after years of local papers taking beatings, after downsizings, after loss of revenue due to the internet, etc., what can this community do to revitalize local media sources so that they can provide the kinds of services necessary to the democratic health of a community. Whoever I, wants to start. I, I'd like to let our media expert, John Crescent, answer this. <laughs> <laughs> the paper has into a horrible publication. What's that? I think the paper, the newspaper, has turned into a horrible publication. Yeah, amen. It does not have any local to speak of, it doesn't. It cuts off at about 10 o'clock. That's right. So you don't get any news in the newspaper, the, the purpose of the newspaper. And, and of course, they're dealing with really hard economic difficulties. You know, the internet, the fact that people did not start, you know, uh, when, when internet news uh, became available to everybody, uh, you know, people didn't pay for it. Uh, so, uh, so, so, uh, assuming, and if anybody wants to say otherwise, welcome that too. But assuming that we all believe that there is a role for uh, freedom of the press and uh, responsible uh, local reporting, uh, what do you think it is, and how can we encourage it in these very different times from 50 years ago? I'm not sure you can. No, I don't think so. So we've got to fund it. We've got that. Uh, well, I, I, I'm going to say one thing that because this is very interesting. Because when I, uh, I, I made a decision yesterday, I was going to try to do it yesterday, never got to it. So now this is brought it back to, back to my mind. Uh, the paper's not perfect. There's no perfect publication. But do you think what we're getting on social media is accurate? Do you think what we're getting on CNN and all those channels is accurate? So come on. So um, we're all, you know, we got our Foxes and we got our CNNs and so forth. But, but I like the paper. And I, I am disappointed in how thin it has gotten. But I like the paper, and when I get home, I am going to pay for a year's subscription for my son Joseph and my son Matthew, because otherwise they don't get what's going on in our local government. And I think, you know, that that needs to be demonstrated to my own children who, I don't know, they get their news from dad, you know, so 
Of course, that's going to be the truth, right? But, uh, but I, I think it is a shame to see the local print media because, see, you, you watch TV. If you miss it, commercial, you mute it, you come back, you get a Coke, you, you miss some of it. But with the paper, it's still there when you get home that night. And you can pick up where you left off in the morning. And I think the paper is real important to Jacksonville, Florida. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm a big supporter, and my boys are going to get papers, and they dig I'm sure better get the money. My money's worth out of them. 12% of the people are reading the Times Union right now. Well, that doesn't matter. But, but that, it does 12, matter. That, that it does 12. matter because you have to ask the question, well, where are the, where are the majority of the people getting their news? And well, I'd, I'd submit to you that a, a lot of it is television. And that's a, that's a weakness. John Crescent been shaking his head. Let me tell you something. What is really aggravating, if you have somebody come and interview you, is that they ask questions that indicate they don't have a clue what you're doing and what the issue is. They want you to educate them, uh, educate them to the degree that they can answer sensible questions. Uh, the only decent media in this town, as far as I'm concerned, is, is in television, is Channel 4, and that's Jim Piggott, main, mainly, more than anybody else. There are a couple of others with 4. Uh, at least he gets down there and he works. He works hard for information, but the rest of them, they're all looking for and a I, sensational story. That's what they're looking I, for. I, I don't want to get different uh, media sources competing against each other, but uh, I, I do hope that we can uh, hear the need to support uh, a free and uh, critical and questioning uh, and necessary is what I'm hearing, what I think too, uh, media. Uh, we have a few minutes. Can we get some questions? I, I'm sure we've got a lot. Oh, um, yes, right here. Let, let, me, let me bring no, microphones. I microphone. I got a <laughs> For sure. Other questions or comments or lots of hands? Yes. Uh, uh, you need a mic? Yeah. You run mics. Around. All right, well, my name is Connell Crooms. Um, trying to have, have, been thinking about how to phrase this question. Um, in all actuality, uh, it came, came to my attention back in January that uh, 
this year would be Jacksonville's 50th uh, birthday, although this city is actually older than uh, 50 years, but it's 50 years since consolidation. It came to my attention back in January. That actually prompted me to do some investigation. So I went to this, went to my family, my family of which has been here for three generations, all right? Now, if I put that into perspective, three generations in the city government is only 50 years old. So that uh, prompted me to go, go back to my family and they told me the stories of you know, the, the riots, the race issues, and all these different things. And I, I'm also a student of A. Philip Randolph. And I heard, learned so much more about A. Philip Randolph, the people that actually knew him. So I went back and just going, going back to my studies, and I kind of studied uh, all of what A. Philip Randolph did exactly about what exactly happened to uh, Jacksonville's working class. Now, I've been talking and preaching about uh, solidarity and uniting the people, black and white, for years. And uh, this, uh, nothing that is being discussed about consolidation is news to me, but there's been a lot of truth coming out lately about consolidation. And I'll tell you what, no one, no one else on, on, sitting on this panel and uh, largely the audience doesn't know. I'll tell the audience what, uh, you, what you often won't hear. And I'll tell people on this panel what you probably know, but you often won't hear. Uh, None of these folks speak for black people. I, I, I can tell you, as somebody whose family has been here for three generations and have, is black themselves, we were sold out. Point blank, period. We were sold out. Now, Alvin Brown doesn't speak for me. Not Garrett Dennis, not any black person on that, on that is sitting, currently past and present sitting on city council. Even Earl Johnson would admit that although black people voted two to one for consolidation, we were sold out. It wasn't just black people who were sold out, but it was also the poor white working class that was also sold out. So the fact remains that this is, a, this is a city government that not only, yes, we did get the Jaguars, but also it's important to remember that we need to stop hiding behind Jaguars because we have failures. You know, every time we talk about our failures, we hide, we hide behind the successes of the Jaguars. And there's this idea that winning solved a whole lot of problems, but you only play for so long, for so many months, that then reality kicks back in, you say, you know, we're a city with a whole lot of problems. Now the fact remains that Jaguars came to Jacksonville because we were a small market team for the same reason that Green Bay had the team. We were a small market working class city that could support a small market team. That, that's just a fact. But now we have a billionaire owner who is only interested in actually growing the power of, of, uh, of downtown and doing, doing what he wants to do. I'm not really interested in the Jaguars, but I, I, I say that as a point. I say that as a historical, uh, a historical point, a historical focal point, where we can look back and we say, okay, this is all that has happened in Jacksonville. Now, my question to all of you all, now I'm getting to the question. My question to all of you all is, what you knew 50 years ago is currently what you're now coming out to say, hmm, well, yeah, we knew this 50 years ago, we knew the demographic changes were happening, and we also are currently a city, and I think a lot of people who live in the beaches can attest to this fact. We're all not only a city that is going through racial demographic changes, we're also going through generational changes. So what you know, knew 50 years ago, and now, and now know 50 years present, how could you then sell consolidation knowing all of these problems, all of these holes that we had as a city government? Yeah. Woo. Uh, so, real quickly, and then I, in the interest of time, I want to get, there are several other hands up too, but uh, Mr. Carlucci? My, my quick answer would be, I would sell consolidation the same way because of what happened prior to consolidation. There were, there was not any strong black representation then. The neighborhoods were worse. I hear you, I'm not tone deaf, Mr. Grooms. You're a, a very smart, educated man, and you brought some good points, but it was the time, and it was an economic issue that uh, Earl Johnson saw at the time, and I don't think anybody can say they don't have second thoughts about decisions they make, but his final decision was consolidation was probably the best thing that happened to Jacksonville. And um, you can call Earl Johnson Jr. and ask him about that. He'll and I, I just want to real quickly say that tonight should not be the end of the discussion. These discussions need to continue and keep going in the community. Um, did you have, yeah. you need a mic? No, okay. I like your Chamlin's book mine shirt. But. Back in the 80s and the 60s and early 70s, that's what they call the five-stop 
Jacksonville is a, a much more diverse city than most people uh, probably not only recognize but realize. Uh, other, uh, Richard Bowers, I know you wanted to say how something. A tough, how about a tough question from the audience instead of commentary? Well, uh, Richard may have some of both. Good, that's good. I have a question for you. Did you realize that Earl Johnson ran at large the first time? Mm -mm. He was not a district councilman. Did you good. realize he was the first African American? who is the, the president of the city council. And do you realize, I personally think, and this is nuanced, that it wasn't race that caused Earl Johnson not to be the mayor. There are other factors that we don't need to, to, to go in, into tonight. Matt, you said something that really is not quite accurate. The city, neither the city nor the county had a planning department until Jake Gonbo came in and formed the first planning department. We had a planning commission which had absolutely no authority except that they met and they laid out plans like the bridge to nowhere and other places and sometimes these plans were used and a good bit of the time they were not used. Uh, and uh, everybody was very nice about it. A guy named Ed Baker ran it, but what, what stimulated having a planning department the chamber in 1974 had a conference called the Amelia Island Conference. They invited 100 people, representative of all over the city, and at the, at the planning conference, one of the things they came up with was the planning department. They also came up with an emphasis on downtown. But I gotta say one other thing. You, you, you forget, prior to 1968, there was no urban renewal in this town. Uh, and that, when, when consolidation, the day of consolidation, if you lived where the, 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 the junior college or the state college downtown was, if you lived out there, you could sit in your outhouse and see the city hall <laughs> downtown through the little mirror, through the little window. They're absolutely, they're, so, and that was because of urban renewal and within four years that, that was all cleared. Now, Eric made a, made a very good point. Tommy Azuri lost because of the tolls. And part of it was he called the people who were against taking down the coals the fat cats, and they never forgot it and uh, reminded him on a regular basis. But that was an issue that 
uh, that made uh, Tommy a, a one-time chairman. But there have, there's been, when you talk about the Northwest Quadrant, you got to remember a couple of things. As soon as people reached a, a middle income level who lived in the Northwest Quadrant, they moved. Yeah. Starting with Earl, who moved to Mandarin. Starting with Bess and Ben Canny, who moved to San Marco. Starting with a whole group that lived on Sugar Hill, who moved, and suddenly we had an integrated community that we had not had before. And if you look at the statistics, the census tracts, you can see that in the census tract information. The reason that uh, we, had no, we had no housing codes, we had no way to help people fix their houses, yes, the Northwest Quadrant still has issues, but it certainly doesn't have the issues that it had 50 years ago. Yes, a lot of work still needs to be done, septic tanks and everything else, and I, and I need to shut up, but, but you, 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 you got to remember, as you, live, as you sit here at the beach, in your city built, city of Jackson built library, and you, your old senior citizens go to a city built senior citizens center, and, and you, you look every uh, year for your community development money, which was only secured by the city of Jacksonville. If you hadn't been an urban service district of the city of Jacksonville, you would have had to compete and maybe get a grant every seven years from the uh, from the state, so there are a lot of advantages that that uh, uh, race continues to be an issue, uh, ethnic groups continue to be an issue, but compared to 50 years ago, and uh, and I, I I gotta tell you one nuanced story. We got money real quick. We got we got money to build community health clinics, and we went to uh, we went to to Marietta to build a health clinic. And we met with the community in Marietta and said, this is where we want to build it, by the Thomas Jefferson Civic Center and the school. And they said, no, don't build it out there. There, We've got a better piece of, of county land that you already own you can build it on. We said, where's that? They said, it's over on Old Plank Road. It's where our county commissioner kept his horse stables. And it was county land. And when we went out there, there were horse stables on that land. And we cleared it, and that's where they're their, uh, their health clinic was built. And I'm sorry. Thank, thank you for the clarification, Dick. I'm, I'm looking at Teresa. I'm looking at the clock saying 904. 904? Oh, I didn't even realize. Can we get, it, it, Teresa, can, I, can, can we get one question more? Okay. Who has a question, not, not a comment? As much as I value those, I, I, you're closer, so it's not fair. I'm sorry. Well, being close sometimes works. Uh, how did consolidation affect the school system? Was the school system always a county school system? We had a we had a, a, count, a county school system. And that's a good question you ask because under consolidation, the uh, school board was part of the city budget at consolidation, and the city approved that budget. And only when we got a, uh, and Walter Williams, is Walter still here? No. He's gone. Anyway, anyway, what happened was yeah, is, is at that time we had, if you remember, the schools were disaccredited very much in Duval County. And the school budget came under the Consolidated City. And the city wanted to, some of the city leaders wanted to change the superintendent. And as a matter of fact, one of the amendments that was made was that uh, that if the present the, the present school superintendent's uh, salary would be fixed at a certain amount, and if was, if he were there six months from now, it would be zero. So that was one way they were trying to get out. But but the budget. But what happened was, is we hired a fellow named Cecil Hardesty. Some of you might remember him, as a school superintendent from California, and he said he would only take this job. If, if the legislature would take the Duval school system out of the city budget and that they could present their own budget. I don't know whether that answered your question or not. What I was looking at is how did it affect the fact that we had to go, we were integrated with busing, would that have affected any of that development? Mm -hmm. um, no. 
I was very as far as the schools were concerned. Yeah, no, I didn't affect. I don't think no. it would have. Mm -hmm. I, no. uh, we'll, we would have always wrestled with that. Yeah, and still are to a degree. Well, I, we I mean, I, I think we needed to do that. But had it not been, had we not consolidated, would downtown Jacksonville have had their own? school systems and you would no, not. It was a no, county, it was a county school county system. School system. So yeah, was, there was no yeah. city school fact, system. No. Ish Brandt was uh, at one time the school superintendent and he was an icon out at the beach. He was mayor mayor of Jacksonville Beach at one time. No, Neptune. Jacksonville also. Oh yeah, well he was both. But yeah. Neptune last. Yeah, Neptune last. Yeah. See, he was he was mayor when I was mayor of Atlantic Beach. Yeah. Good yeah, question. Well, good question. Well, the question but, was, but, it, it was a county school system before, so it didn't change that. Thank you guys all for going out. We could keep going until 3 a.m. Can we give a... Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you. 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 I think we lost place for our audience. I think we lost. At 10 o'clock, the history of the Mayo Clinic comes on. It's very interesting. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. 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 Thank